Well, I love this time of year. I love the fall. An FPCG or posted this on Facebook this past week, and I thought it was just so perfect and beautiful. I wanted to share it with all of you. How many of you would agree that you love the, this is your favorite time of the year, fall? Any, any fall lovers here? And now, apart from fall being the season before winter, which is a whole different story, I think this is probably my favorite season of the year. I love the colors of the trees. I like the chill in the air. I even like it when it gets kind of gray and blustery. My wife disagrees with me, but I even like that. I also love the fall because it's football season. Uh, by the way, uh, somebody could please notify the Bears that it's already football season. Um, along with getting to watch my favorite high school team play, I also find myself nostalgically remembering my own playing days. Um, it dawned on me when I found this photo, and that's not been retouched. Uh, this was in 1973 at Byron Hills High School in Armonk, New York. Um, and it dawned on me when I found this photo that it was taken almost exactly 41 years ago this weekend. When that number hit my mind, I just went, how is that possible? And no, we didn't wear leather helmets back then. But I remember the next to last game of my high school senior year. We're playing a league rival. We still had a chance to save our season. We had two wins and four losses at that time with two games still to go. And if we won those last two games, we would avoid becoming the first team in our school's history to have a losing season. And that was pressure. Um, it was a close game, and we were down 13-7 to in the fourth quarter. The other team had the ball. It was, about, it was fourth down, about one yard to go. And if we could stop them here, we could get the ball back, go down, score a touchdown, we could kick an extra point, win the game 14-13, to and avoid the shame of being the first losing team in our school's history. Now, we only had 22 guys on our team. It was a small school, so all of us had to play offense and defense and all that. So I was quarterback on one side, defensive cornerback on the other side. So I was on defense. Uh, one of my best friends was a team captain named Don Scott, defensive end. And we were waiting there for this key play for the other team to come up and run their play. And all of a sudden, Don, our captain, who typically wasn't like this, he just got all fired up. He turns around with his back to the other team and he starts yelling at us, his teammates. He's going, this stops now. They're not getting past this line. He starts to kick a line of, in the dirt with his cleats like that. He's kicking a line right behind the ball. So like this is the line they're not getting. And he's saying it so the other team can hear and everything. They're not getting past this line. We stop them here. And we all start getting all fired up. We're woofing and hollering. We're going to get you and, we're, and all that. So we're waiting, we're waiting. They come up the line. Their quarterback calls the signals. They snap the ball and they run 10 yards right over us. You didn't see that coming, did you? Ten, just right over us, first down, uh, game over. We lost the last two games of the year. We did become the first losing team in the history of our high school. Um, at, it was only seven years old as a high school, so it wasn't like 50 years or anything, but we still were the first team. Football is all about overcoming the opposition. And sometimes, as I learned, uh, the other guys win. And that leads me to where we are now in our series in Acts. We're in our series called Growing Pains, Reaching Brings Problems. Let me give you a little review so far. You maybe not have been here you know, for each part of the series, but our first series of the fall, remember Acts was uh, written by Luke, who is the author of the gospel according to Luke. It's sort of a sequel to the story of Jesus. This is the story of the church. And our first series was called Beginnings, Reaching the World. In chapter 1 in Acts, Jesus gives a mandate you will be my witnesses to the entire world, he says. So the gospel is going to go to the entire world. Chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. We see the birth of the church, the believers devoted to the apostles' teaching, devoted to each other. Chapter 3 comes, we see the dramatic healing of a man born lame, and we see Peter preaching. And now there's up to 5,000 people have come to faith. All this is just a couple of weeks. And then comes chapter 4, which we started a couple of weeks ago, and the growing pains start. Peter and John, after healing this man and preaching, are arrested and thrown in prison, warned never to do it again by the same people who put Jesus on the cross. So they begin to face oppositions. The church gathers and they pray. And what they pray for is boldness. They ask God to pour out his spirit and do more signs and wonders, more healings, so they can actually preach the gospel more boldly. That brings us to Acts chapter 5, where we are today. Let me read the first part of this for you, Acts 5. I'll be in verse 12 to 16 as we start. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. Remember, that was part of the temple, the same place where the man who was lame was healed and the, 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 story, the story started. None of the rest dared join them because there was opposition, there were threats, but the people held them in high esteem. 
And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed." Now we're going to stop there. The first thing we see as we work our way through this chapter 5 of the story is the power of the gospel. That's what these first few verses are about, the power of the gospel. Now I've told several stories of the, over the past few weeks uh, from my recent trip to the Middle East, to Dubai. And today I want to tell one more. This is, by the way, a picture of the uh, Al Jumeirah Mosque in Dubai. We got to visit there and it was quite an experience to see. On the night before I left to, to return home, uh, we had dinner with several Muslim background believers who shared their stories with us. And one of them was a woman, uh, maybe in her mid-50s, and she said she'd only known one Christian her whole life, and she'd never even seen a Bible up until this story occurs. She followed Islam because that's what she was expected to do, but she said by the, by the time she was an adult, she no longer really believed that her obedience and her prayers every day actually resulted in any help from Allah at all. But she still practiced all the Islamic rituals. Then one Saturday night, and she said very specifically, it was a Saturday night, uh, while she was sleeping, she had a series of three identical dreams. She said each time in her dream, she saw a tombstone with a white casket in front of it. Tombstone, white casket. She would then wake up, and as she woke up out of her dream, she was speaking out loud in her language. And what she was saying was, why do you look for the living among the dead? She didn't understand why. She didn't know what the sentences were. She'd never heard them before. But she had the same dream three times in a row. All three times, the same night, she woke up saying those words out loud. So the next morning was Sunday, which is a normal work day. In the Islamic world, they worship on Fridays. So she calls her Christian friend and just tells her about the dreams because dreams are very significant in the Muslim world. Her friend gets all excited and tells her that their dream was about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The woman had heard about Jesus through the Quran, but then knew nothing about him. So her friend explained the empty tomb and how the angels had said to the women, why do you look for the living among the dead? And then she got really excited. And she said, I almost forgot. Today is Easter Sunday, the day Christians celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That woman, through that dream, those three dreams, that day became a follower of Jesus. Now, her story was much more complicated than that, but I believe her story to be a modern-day miracle. What the Bible here refers to as signs and wonders. Luke says, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. Signs and wonders were what we would today call miracles. That is, events that could only be explained by some supernatural power outside of human understanding. And in this case, in the Bible... They are uh, events that point people to Jesus and to the power of the gospel. It started in chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes through a mighty wind that people can hear. They see tongues of fire and the apostles speak or share the gospel in languages they've never studied, signs and wonders. 3,000 people came to faith that first day, we were told. Then in Acts 3, we see the story of the man born lame, begging for money. He's instantaneously healed, signs and wonders, uh, it starts leaping around, a crowd gathers, and Peter uses that opportunity to preach, and 2,000 more people come to faith in Jesus. And this is the pattern we will see over and over again throughout the book of Acts. One uh, scholar has said that this pattern occurs some 17 times in the chapters of the book of Acts, and the experience is always similar. Signs and wonders, something dramatic happens, the preaching of the gospel, and then people come to faith. Here Luke wants us to see by how he tells the story the clear connection between signs and wonders and people coming to faith in Jesus. This is what the believers prayed for in chapter 4, and it's what's happening now. Now my question tonight is, uh, what does this look like today? I'm sure you're asking yourself, is God still in the signs and wonders business? Does God do miracles today? When I was in the Middle East just a few weeks ago, I heard several stories that were clearly of the signs and wonders variety, things that made you go, your mind, just, you couldn't even, it was hard to believe, but clearly true. There was no other way to explain these stories. I've heard missionaries from all parts of the world tell all kinds of miraculous stories. And I find myself asking a question, 
why does it seem like this stuff happens in other parts of the world and not so much here in North America? It's actually a pretty good question. Some say it's because we have lots of other places to anchor our faith living in North America. We have affluence, we have plenty of resources, we have hospitals, we have great doctors, we have medicine. Some say it's because we don't ask for signs and wonders. We don't pray for them. Or maybe we ask for the wrong reasons. In Scripture, the healings are never for healing's sake. They're for the sake of sharing the gospel. Some say it's because people around the world are just more desperate in their faith. And having been around these people, that's true. So I really can't answer the question, but I do have some thoughts. Let's remember the purpose of signs and wonders in Scripture. The purpose is gospel transformation of lives. So, and I was thinking about that this week. Is it any less miraculous when a corporate executive in North America who's achieved tremendous personal and financial success after missing yet another birthday for a son or daughter realizes that deep in the inner part of his life he's empty, that without an eternal purpose to his life, nothing really matters. And so without even knowing what he's doing, he kneels in his office so nobody can see under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and he surrenders his life to God. Is that any less miraculous? Is it any less miraculous when a single mother of three, struggling to make her life work, convinced that God has forgotten her, is invited by a caring friend to church, and for the first time in a long time, feels loved and accepted and opens her heart to Jesus? Is that any less miraculous? Is it any less miraculous when a high school sophomore, struggling with identity and self-esteem, struggling with rejection from peers, reluctantly goes on a church retreat and hears the whisper of the Holy Spirit saying, I love you. I made you. You're mine. See, I think signs and wonders happen all the time, are happening all the time all around us now, just perhaps in a different way. We have to learn to see them with eyes of faith. Signs and wonders were to point people toward the gospel, to point people toward Christ. Secondly, we, secondly, we see in Acts, uh, Acts 5 the response of opposition. In, in verse 17 of chapter 5 we read, But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. And this doesn't really make sense when you think about it. People are getting healed. There's miracles happening. And yet there's this group of religious folks who are really angry at what's happening. doesn't make any sense. Why does the gospel produce offense? Why are people offended? I've told this little story before, so if you remember it, just bear with me. But it, it illustrates, I think, the point. Back in my seminary days, a long time ago, uh, I had to take a course called Clinical Pastoral Education, which involved serving as a chaplain in a large suburban hospital for a semester. There were about six or eight students in my group, all from different seminaries around the greater Chicago area, for all from different theological backgrounds. And we would take turns uh, once or twice a week sharing our thoughts during a weekly devotional time. You know, all seminary students, all people studying for ministry, sharing devotional time. And when my turn came, I decided to start with a quote from a book I happened to be reading at the time, one of my favorite authors. And the quote reminded me that even though I was called to minister, I believed, I could not forget that I was still a sinful creature by nature. The book is called Telling the Truth. The writer is Frederick Buechner. Here's the quote. I'm a part-time novelist who happens also to be a part-time Christian from time to time, I find a kind of heroism momentarily possible, a seeing, doing, telling of Christly truth. But most of the time, and this is the part I emphasized, most of the time I am indistinguishable from the rest of the herd that jostles and snuffles at the great trough of life. Part-time novelist, Christian, pig. And I use the word pig uh, to lead into the verse from 1 Timothy 1.15 where Paul says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And my devotional thoughts were built around that. And when I was finished, I was pretty happy with myself. I thought it was pretty good, pretty deep. But wow, was I surprised. That group was mad. They were angry. Did I mention most of them were women? I don't think they liked the pig analogy very well. They were like, how dare you? One lady said, how dare you insinuate that I'm a sinner, she said. 
I learned um, that people don't like to be called sinners. Even people going to seminary don't like to be inferred as sinners. I once saw a quote that said, before a man can be convinced to become a Christian, he must be convinced he's a pagan. That's a difficult process. The gospel offends. The gospel offended the religious leaders of Jesus' day because they believed they were made righteous through their religious behavior, through their religious sacrifices. Jesus offended them because he didn't behave in very religious ways sometimes. He hung out with the wrong people. He said some of the wrong things. Jesus offended them because they didn't expect the Messiah to die on a Roman cross. The gospel was an offense. Today, Muslims all over the world find the gospel offensive for many, many reasons. First, they believe Christians, they believe we are polytheists because how we teach the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're confused by that. They say we worship multiple gods. They're offended by that. They think uh, they, do not, they don't believe Jesus is the Son of God because no God would ever allow his own son to be put to death by sinful men. Therefore, they don't believe Jesus really died. That was Judas on the cross. Therefore, Jesus didn't really raise from the dead. They're offended by the gospel. Many people in our own culture find the gospel offensive because they regard it as the pinnacle of religious arrogance to make the claim of absolute truth. How dare, you think me, you, how dare you think you can tell me that you have the truth for me? They'll say, hey, that's great for you. That's fine for you. But that's not my truth. The gospel offends because it offends our notion of fairness. Fairness. The gospel isn't built on fairness. There's nothing fair at all about the gospel. It's built on grace. The gospel isn't about getting what we deserve. Our whole culture is built on getting what you deserve. Not the gospel. It's about getting what we don't deserve. The gospel isn't about our goodness at all. It's about the goodness of Christ himself who gave himself for us. So these early believers are preaching a gospel that creates offense. And they're facing real opposition, serious opposition. And that leads to thirdly in chapter 5, a miraculous deliverance. There's all kinds of great movies about prison escapes. I don't know what your favorite one is. I just thought of them off the top of my head. How about Clint Eastwood and Escape from Alcatraz? How many have seen that movie? Anybody? There's Steve McQueen, The Great Escape, way back in the day. Okay. Morgan Freeman, Tim Robbins, and Shawshank Redemption. All of them great movies. But all these prison escape movies uh, kind of follow a similar pattern. The escape is the result of a painstaking effort taken by someone in prison to dig an incredibly long tunnel with a spoon or to crawl through half a mile of sewage pipes on your belly, or to swim across the San Francisco Bay with one arm, whatever it is. They escape, and then they're all similar in that the escapee gets as far away as possible, different country, different continent, change your identity, plastic surgery, anything just to get away, right? That's how they all work. Watch what happens in this story. Acts 5, verse 19. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council and all the senate of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. Okay. An angel of the Lord, literally a messenger from God, sets them free in the middle of the night. Boom, you got the miracle. Everyone agree? That's a miracle. Miracle escape from prison. I mean, check it out. A divine prison escape right here. But notice what happens next. God gets them out and then tells them to do what? Go back to the place that got you arrested in the first place. That makes no sense. Are you kidding me? Makes no sense, that is, unless the purpose of the miracle is not the escape at all. The purpose of the miracle is the proclamation of the gospel itself. Which leads us to the fourth thing in chapter 5, which is a fearless witness. The story continues. And someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Can't even say the name. 
We told you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Okay, gets them out of prison, sends them back to the same place to do the same thing that got them arrested for his purposes. Some 15 or 18 years ago, uh, and I don't know if anybody here is in, in the, the room that remembers this, but a man came and spoke at FBCG at our East Campus named Joseph Stone. Joseph Stone was pastor in Romania during the brutal rule of Nicolae uh, Ceausescu. I'm not sure if that's the way you say his name, but it was a brutal time in, in Romania. Uh, pastor Stone was arrested and imprisoned several times during the 1970s and eventually charged with the crime of being a Christian minister. Each time he was arrested, he went under intense interrogation, uh, sometimes for weeks at a time. Sometimes uh, he suffered physical beatings. During one particularly brutal session, and he shared this in his own testimony, the officer said to him, Pastor Son, don't you know I have the power and authority to have you killed today and nobody will ever find your body? Pastor Son said, I know you have that power and authority, but you should know this. Your supreme weapon is killing. My supreme weapon is dying. With all due respect, sir, let me tell you how this will work. You know my sermon tapes are spread all over this country. I've been preaching for 20 years, he said. When you shoot me, kill me, or crush me, whichever way you choose, you will sprinkle those sermon tapes with my blood, and I will speak 10 times louder in my death than I ever spoke in my life. In fact, I will conquer this country for God if you kill me. That's how it will work, with all due respect. Later, a few weeks after that, pa uh, Pastor Sohn was called in by the chief of the secret police. Uh, and he said, Mr. Sohn, we want you to know that we know your plan. We know your strategy. We know you want to become a martyr. We are not so foolish as to kill you. <laughs> so they exiled him. He came to America. He continued to preach until Romania fell. And Dr. Sohn was exactly right. But what does that mean for us? What does it mean for us to be fearless in witness? Now, we don't face arrest and prison for proclaiming the gospel, at least not yet in our culture, in our country. Maybe we never will. We don't know. But we might have, you might have, family or friends who are critical or who are hostile toward the gospel, toward the faith, and by inference toward you. You might work in an environment that, that discourages or even ridicules faith. What does it mean? In our culture, it means to trust the truth of the gospel. The gospel is as true today as it was 2,000 years ago. It means to be willing to obey God rather than men. And it means to share in a kind of strange rejoicing. And that's the fifth thing that we see in chapter 5, what I'm calling a strange rejoicing. Let's work our way through these last few verses. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. Let me say a word about Gamaliel here. Gamaliel uh, was the rabbinical teacher of Saul of Tarsus, who eventually became the Apostle Paul. So Gamaliel is a very learned man, a man of great respect. So he stands up. And all this hubbub is going on, all these threats going on. He sends the, Peter and John and the other apostles out of the room, and he talks just to the people who want to kill them. All right? And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care in what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of our people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this understanding is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So what he's saying is, you already killed their leader, Jesus. So... If this is like all the others, they'll just go away after a while, leave them alone. 
But if it is of God, you're going to be in big trouble, he says. Interesting here. Gamaliel is either showing a voice of intelligence and reason, or he's giving away evidence that maybe the faith and witness of these early apostles, he's been watching what's going on. He's been listening to them. Maybe it's starting to get to him. In the very next chapter, in a couple of weeks, we're going to look at the murderous rampage of Saul of Tarsus as it begins, before he becomes Paul the Apostle. And one wonders if Saul, the young man Saul, thought his teacher had gone soft on these rebels. Continue. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Okay, so an angel gets them out of prison Tells them to go back and preach in the same place that got them arrested, so they're arrested again. Then they're warned again, stop doing that or else. And then, and I almost missed this when I was preparing this message. I almost missed this one little line. And then they are also beaten. Up until now, they'd been warned. They'd been warned sternly. Here, they are beaten. The opposition is ratcheted up a bit. Can you put yourself in their shoes? It's one thing to be yelled at, to be threatened, have a finger pointed in your face. It's another thing to be physically beaten. Their faith now, their obedience was costing them something. Now watch how the story ends. Then they left the presence of the council after having been beaten. They left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from the house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. I get like goosebumps in the back of my neck when I read that paragraph. And I do so because some 15 years or so ago, I had the chance to preach in Russia at a sister church then in a city called Samara. Before the service, I met with the pastor. His name was Viktor Ryaguzov. He's still pastor in that area of the world. This is Pastor Viktor. Uh, I met with Victor and his elders for prayer. The elders were truly elders. There were the, they were, uh, it was a table, a, a, a long table, surrounded by about 10 or 12 old, white-haired, grizzled Russian men. Uh, and they were sitting around the table, and Pastor Victor, before we prayed, he went around the table. He introduced every one of these men to me, and he shared me just a little snippet of their story. And I don't remember all of them, but it went kind of like this. This is Brother Alexei. He spent 20 years in a labor camp because he was a pastor. This is Brother Dimitri. The communist took his house and his entire business when they found out he was a pastor. This is Brother so-and-so. He went on and on. All 12 of them, of these men, had suffered directly, personally, prison, labor camp, torture, lost property, lost businesses because of the name. Every single one of them. And they had asked me, to preach. I felt about this big. Later after the service, I was invited to participate in an ordination of a very young pastor, 22 years old. His name was also Victor. As he was taking his ordination vows, it was being translated to me by a young man who was speaking into my ear. And I don't recall all the vows, but I do remember two questions they asked this young man as he was in front of the whole church. They asked him, do you vow to preach the gospel in season and out of season? He went, da which is yes. And that's a fairly standard commitment for pastors and even ordinations here. Then the next question took me by surprise. The next question was, do you vow to be faithful to Christ and his church even unto suffering and death? That one I'd never heard before. That one was not part of my ordination here in America. I thought of all those men I'd met around that table men who had lost something, men who had suffered something. I looked at that 22-year-old pastor, steely blue eyes, and he looked back at the man conducting the ordination, and he didn't even flinch. He went, da. Yes. I felt like I was living in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is still going on. This isn't some ancient story we're looking at, like a museum piece. This was the birth of the church. These are our ancestors. We are their descendants. We are here because of these stories. And this story is still unfolding, being told. So what is our opposition right now? We don't face the same things even brothers and sisters in the world right now face. What what is our opposition? Maybe it's a, a discouraging life circumstance. 
Maybe a painful thing is happening in your life that you don't understand and it threatens your confidence in God and your confidence in God's love and care for you. Maybe it's a person or a group of people or a family who ridicule your faith or have done something to hurt you. Maybe your opposition is the world itself full of temptation and distractions. So how do we overcome this opposition? What, what is the lesson to be learned in chapter 5 here? Well, we don't overcome opposition by force. There are some who say we should. But the sword has never been a very effective spiritual weapon in the world. Not by politics. Power has never served the gospel very well throughout history. We overcome by truth. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. Jesus is coming again. Truth. We overcome by conviction. We are convicted to obey God rather than men. And we overcome by a strange kind of joy. A strange kind of joy. In all of Scripture, there may, not, there may not be a more moving and challenging sentence than this for me and maybe for you. Then they left the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Rejoicing. Will you bow with me as I close today? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the book of Acts. Help us to read it and study it, not as some kind of relic from the ancient past that doesn't relate to our lives, but to read it as the story of real people, flesh and blood, like us, who real, lived real lives. Help us to see it as the story of your church. Help us to see it as our story. And grow in us the same kind of faith, bold, courageous, and full of a strange kind of joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.